August 7, 20, or excuse me, 2012 meeting of the Baldwin County Commission. Being that it is 918, we will now open this public hearing on the Horizon 2025 plan. Mr. Arthur Frago, Jr. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I'm blind. I can't see too well. So if y'all will bear with me, my name is Arthur Frago, Jr. I live in the Bombo community. I'm a farmer. My wife tried to read it to me. And after about 15 minutes, I got this bewildered look on my face. And she said, what is it? I said, I don't understand a word you've said. <laughs> so she continued to read. And I got into the back of it and it <coughs> said, you know, compliance and non-compliance. And I said, good Lord, if this magnificent maze of paperwork goes through, it is going to be mandatory. And instead of the old reading, writing, and arithmetic you was taught in school, it'll be rules, regulations, and restrictions. And you're going to have to live with it. Thank you, sir, very much. My name is Dr. Richard Hyland, gentleman of the Baldwin County Commission. The people who created this plan have left no stone unturned in their effort to regulate every square inch of land and every drop of water in Bowen County. As an example, my understanding of the horizon, under, horizon plan under water usage and water wells is against individual property owners from drilling personal water wells versus the public use, which it doesn't define what that is. It determines that only water for drinking is essential. It does not address the central use of wells for farmers to irrigate their crops, for renourishment of ponds for cattle, uh, for renourishment of ponds for maybe one day we want to establish a f some fish farms in Bowen County. We've got a lot of water. It may be good business for some people. It's hard to believe that farm irrigation is not addressed as, an, as essential in the Horizon Plan. I find it hard to believe. It has been expressed that since so much time and effort has been spent developing this plan, that it is unthinkable to abolish it. However, I think that in the past four weeks, many more man hours have been spent with citizens pouring over this plan reading it over and over and over, giving of their time to go to meetings and things, giving of their time, and a lot of these people here today are probably giving up time at work to be here. And there'd be a lot more people here if, it, if we don't rescind it, I believe. The persons here today have sacrificed much valuable time to express their opinions, and I think that the commission should rescind this plan today if we don't rescind it today, the next time we meet, I think you're going to have to rent the Mobile Civic Center. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Carol Hyland, Spanish Fork. But the more we've learned about Horizon 2025, the more concerned I am that this plan violates the basic rights of Baldwin County citizens. To give an example, I've been studying the Horizon 2025 land use map. I was especially interested in the wildlife corridors. Horizon 2025 defines a wildlife corridor as follows, quote, a strip of habitat connecting wildlife populations or significant habitat area separated by human activities, such as roads and development. That's right out of the plan. Elsewhere in the plan, it states that such corridors will have no motorized vehicles, such as cars. I outlined these wildlife corridors in red so they could be seen better. Okay. Yeah, let everybody see this. When I did that, I was impressed by the pattern of these corridors. What you see are islands of human population, 
separated by wildlife corridors. Now, I need to stay near the mic here, but if you can see, um, these gray zones are actually cities, and these are traversed in many areas by these wildlife corridors. If no motorized vehicles, if no motorized vehicles are allowed in these areas, how does the plan intend for people to get where they need to go? Will they close roads as they have in some so-called smart growth communities? How am I going to get to Bruno's and come back with five bags of groceries? So I would urge the, urge the commissioners to rescind this plan, rise in 2025 today. Thank you. Mr. John Cutright. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have some, have some photos that I'd like to have put up here. Um, if you could switch them back and forth. Uh, this is, uh, these are plaques that uh, involve the United Nations and the uh, heritage sites and the, uh, through the UNESCO. Um, but I'll get to that in just a second. Again, uh, I'm here uh, against the Horizon Comprehensive Plan. Uh, I am for responsible, common sense use of our lands while ensuring and protecting private property rights of their owners. We have uh, seen many examples across our country where eminent domain has taken property from individuals in the name of the general good of the collective. Uh, I want to point out several areas in the plan specifically. One is uh, 4.5.4, where it uh, identify potentially environmentally, quote, sensitive areas. I have some questions about this, and I think everyone here should also. Who and how are these areas identified? What happens to these properties once they are identified? What rights does the original owner, property owner, have once they are identified? And is eminent domain used once there's a label to this property? Uh, doesn't restricting the uh, rights of an owner to do what uh, he wants with his property actually taking that right away? And does it diminish the property value in some way? Are we pitting the original landowner against the county and the county's legal staff? Because as we all know, whenever the county uh, says uh, you can't do this, then the only recourse that the landowner has is to uh, pursue some action in court at the owner's expense. Again, the county or whoever uh, has a legal staff, uh, they're getting paid uh, and the owner uh, bears the burden of this. Uh, once class classified as a sensitive uh, area, doesn't that remove the owner's uh, rights to do as he wish with that? Uh, isn't that taking the property away from the owner? Another area is 4.8.13. Baldwin County identifies sensitive ha wildlife habitat. Again, who and how do, do these animals uh, get identified? Uh, once they are identified on a specific piece of land, what limits are placed on that land? And at whose cost? Uh, an example is, what if uh, someone sees a bird uh, migrating from, let's say, Mexico on this 40-acre track? And it's a, an endangered bird, all right? How long is that piece of property limited from building on it? Um, do we just not build on it while the bird is there migrating to Mexico? And then who's going to stand out there and identify when the bird leaves? <laughs> Again, once it's identified by the county, the landowner bears the responsibility and cost to fight it in court. All right? <clears throat> Another area. 6.5.2.3, county will adopt developmental standards. Again, who defines each category? Uh, what if they are wrong in reaching their decision? How is it changed? 
uh, once again, the burden and cost is on the landowner. I want to use an example. Uh, we've got a beautiful uh, facility down here at Five Rivers Pavilion. I think uh, anyone that's been down there. What if a migrating bird uh, was seen down there on the causeway and the land was restricted? Would we have been able to have built that beautiful facility down there on Five Rivers? Ask yourself those questions. Um, now getting back into the uh, the Agenda 21 in the UN. I want to address all those individuals regarding conspiracy theories. We heard earlier from an individual with the uh, road and building uh, or bridges, uh, and he threw out a couple terms here that caused me concern and they should cause you concern. Credits, credits, uh, wetland credits, and right behind that, millions of dollars, okay? Your county engineer, Mr. Cal Margaret, comes before you on a progress report for the highway department. This is gonna uh, provide us some wetland mitigation credits. It'll restore that wetlands to a good condition. We'll have to go in and fill the ditches in and, and kind of recreate the wetlands that used to be there, pull out all the uh, invasive species, plants, and do some planting of some natural species, but uh, so we, we're kind of getting a two for one. We're getting to restore this site to a good natural state as well as use it for mitigation credits for our projects. And some of those that have this issue with a conspiracy theory might want to ask this. Would we, would we be considering uh, our government flying drones over private property? Private property. Okay, so, so the conspiracies are real. If you want to ignore them, ignore them at your own peril. Thank you. I am Richard Thompson, uh, live in Fairhope. Own uh, property in unzoned areas of Baldwin County, unincorporated, not subject to the master plan, comprehensive plan, whatever you want to call it, and I'd like to keep it that way, meaning unincorporated, unzoned, and not subject to the master plan. What you have there before you is the uh, introduction in the 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto of 1848 by Karl Marx and his comrade, uh, Frederick Engel, uh, both were political um, theorists. And I find it fascinating if you look at the first plank in the Communist Manifesto, it says, I'll paraphrase, I'll paraphrase within context. If, if you support government land use controls, then you're a candidate for the Communist Party. We'll see you on Thursday. We'll fill our bellies up with uh, potato liquor. We'll raise the red banner, and we'll talk about political theories such as uh, capitalism versus socialism. We might even get into the class struggles between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. It's right there. We're getting real close to following the communistic plan here. Maybe with the little C, not the big C. Also, if you check out the uh, Communist Manifesto, and I read many versions of it, it's all pretty much the same. I don't read German, but so I got it in English. You'll find from reading the, com from, uh, the Communist Manifesto that it's merely a guide. It's a suggestion. It's not mandated. Don't worry about it, okay? Don't worry about it. I better end it there, but I did write a little poem. May I recite my poem? Certainly, Mr. Please. Thompson. Thank you so very much. There once was the county of Baldwin, with boot coodles a good land for all men. Then came the moaners, the planners and zoners, who made renters, not owners, of all of our fine sons and daughters. Amen, brother. <laughs> And in conclusion, and in conclusion, I'd like to say, can the plan, it's, it's draconian, can that baby, can it? Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Arthur Oaken. Uh, I'm currently the vice chairman of the Baldwin County Planning and Zoning Commission. We ask today that the County Commission table action on Draft Resolution 2012-075 until the Commission's October meeting.
It is not a law. By its own terms, it is not a law. When we apply the uh, Horizon 2025 to our deliberations as a Planning and Zoning Commission, we consult it. We refer to it. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. Ken Freeman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Mr. Chairman and Commission, I really appreciate uh, being able to speak to you folks. In fact, I wanted to speak to you so bad that I drove six and a half hours to be here. My name is Kenneth Freeman. I'm uh, from North Alabama, up south of Huntsville. I have a cattle ranch on the Tennessee River. I'm also chairman of a group called Alliance for Citizens' Rights. And uh, we have been working on property rights and constitutional issues for over 15 years now. In fact, my partner Don there has been at this over 20 years. So we're quite dedicated to this cause. And uh, people ask me a lot of times how I got into to doing this. Uh, I was always a cowboy, a loner. And you got more than six people in a room, and I started looking for a door. And now what am I doing? I'm spending a lot of time in a truck or a car going to talk to people who are just like most of this audience here, trying to save their rights and their property. Now, I've heard a lot of discussion here today about this not being a plan. It's not a law. It's not something that you have to do. And that is true. But there are a couple of things that you need to know. It doesn't have to be a plan to be enforceable. You can be extorted into it or you can be bribed into it. We got into a discussion one time about the term willing seller. When the government takes property by eminent domain, a lot of times they end up being uh, buying the property from a so-called willing seller. And I described that. I, I, Primarily what I do is take complicated issues and try to put them in simple terms. I call it Bubba Talk, so that ordinary people can get the gist of it. And a willing seller is, say, like most of you folks here, you're walking along minding your own business, say you're in, in a big city somewhere, and a guy steps out from an alley and sticks a 357 in your ear and pulls a hammer back and says, give me your money or I'm going to blow your head off. Now, you become immediately, if you've got any sense, a willing contributor. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you wanted to give him your money. That meant that the alternative was even worse. And that's what we're dealing with here. Now, I've got about one paragraph I'm going to read, and then I'll go back to ad living because everybody is tired. It's been a long day. But just so you know where we are, uh, none of this is law. There has never been a treaty passed in the United States that makes us abide by Agenda 21 or the Biodiversity Treaty. Back in the mid-90s, the uh, Biodiversity Treaty came up before the U.S. Senate. And a gentleman by the name of Dr. Michael Kaufman, who had worked from one of the big paper companies, had studied Agenda 21 and he had done computer models. In fact, I saw some maps out here, all that, the maps with all the, the red and green splotches on it. Well, his analysis said that this is the property that will be taken from the American people under the Biodiversity Treaty. And then uh, later on, the Senate, actually, they, were, they had the votes to pass it. And after his presentation, when the senators found out what was involved here, I think it was defeated like 98 to 2. They saved us from that. So the Biodiversity Treaty has never been passed. And yet, every branch of the federal government acts as if it has. Every single branch of the federal government has signed a letter of agreement with the United Nations under Agenda 21 that they will fulfill the tenets of sustainable development. In fact, every five years, the United States has to sub submit a document to the United Nations telling them what progress has been made. So I'm just going to read through some of this. It's a little, a little shorter and concise. I hate to read, but I'm going to get into it anyway. None of these policies, obviously, under the federal constitution are legal. And they know it. The federal government knows that what they're trying to do in taking people's private property and moving people off of their land and doing other things is totally unconstitutional. But how do they accomplish this? They do it with bribes called grant money or threats of reducing that. 
by bribing local governments into compliance with offers of grant money or threats to withhold grant money if they do not comply, as the case may be. The federal government and the environmental movement pushes an agenda promoted by the United Nations under Agenda 21 and other socialist utopians that should it be tested in court, they know is totally contrary to the Constitution. But these ordinances, these local ordinances, are passed by unsuspecting local governments and they take on the color of law. They appear to be law, even if they're not. This is how they circumvent the protections affirmed by our Constitution. Every comprehensive plan constitutes a de facto contract with the federal government whereby extreme pressure is applied on local governments to comply with the plan or be denied federal grant money. So your county commissions, your local governments are just like that guy walking down the street. The federal government walks up, sticks a pistol in their ear and basically says, we're gonna withdraw funds for all the things you want to do unless you comply. So is it legal? No. Has it ever been signed into treaty? No. Is it being implemented? Absolutely. You better believe it. And then I've, I've heard people talk about all the local participation in setting up this plan. Well, now we've watched these things for 20 years and I can tell you right now that your plan is virtually identical to the plans in Georgia, in Missouri, anywhere else, including the rest of the world. Local Agenda 21 is being pushed under ICLA, which is Local Agenda 21. We have two major cities, Huntsville and Birmingham, that have signed agreements with ICLA. They're getting grant money from that program or from the Federals to fulfill that program. And then people talk about it being a conspiracy. Well, something's not a conspiracy when you know about it. There's no way in the world that it can be called a conspiracy at this point. Now, it was an attempt to be a conspiracy because the news media has agreed for 40 years, according to David Rockefeller, to hide this from the light of public scrutiny. And he said at the Bilderberg Conference that he, he thanked the Times Magazine and, uh, and all these people, the New York Times, for, for not allowing any public scrutiny for 40 years because he knew that the people would fight against it. But he said now that they're more sophisticated, they will accept socialism. And the last line of that statement says, certainly government run by trained public bureaucrats and the world banks will be far better for the world than the system that we have now of states. He's talking the United States and other countries. So yes, they attempted to make it a conspiracy and they did for a very long time, but now people are beginning to find out about it. Now, the black helicopter crowd and by the way, they're not black, they're green with black numbers on. But anyway, the people that accuse us of being the black helicopter crowd, there must be a lot of black helicopters these days because about two months ago, the RNC, the Resolution Committee of the Republican National Party, drew up a very strong anti-Agenda 21 resolution. And it's entitled, I believe, something like understanding the evils of Agenda 21. All right, that has passed 100% out of committee. It will be voted on the end of this month in Tampa. It has a 99% chance of passing there and then it will become part of the Republican national platform. Okay, about two weeks ago, yeah, that's, that's good news. About two weeks ago, the Alabama Republican Party passed a resolution based on that one and is virtually identical about the evils of Agenda 21. And in the last two paragraphs, they, they praised uh, Senator Gerald Dial and Representative Steve McMillan for their hard work in passing SB 477, which is a due process bill, and some people call it the anti-Agenda 21 bill. And, uh, and so, you know, we got black helicopter people everywhere. And then this SB 477, this is a very strong document that just says basically you can't take people's property without due process as required under both the U.S. and the Alabama Constitution. And uh, as required, which it is, 
if you follow the tenets of Agenda 21. So this is a very powerful document. Now I knew when we helped draw up that bill that if it passed, it was gonna get national attention. I did not know it was gonna get worldwide attention. There have been articles published in the London Tele Telegraph and uh, the London Times, I believe, and, and papers in Australia and New Zealand, all over the world where the governments are already more socialist than we are here in the United States, and they're already suffering the consequences of Worldwide Agenda 21. So, you know, it's a, it's a crying shame when you have to read a foreign newspaper to find out what's going on in your own country, but that's what's happening. Uh, on this issue here, year 2025, I know there was an article in the Mobile Times where they talked about, you know, uh, people shouldn't, conspiracy theorists shouldn't be allowed to, to write bills and, uh, and crazy people shouldn't be allowed to be on the internet. Now, it's amazing to me how they're always so in favor of freedom of speech until you're saying something they don't want to hear. And then all of a sudden, your speech should be curtailed and your ability of your representatives should be curtailed. So anyway, uh, getting toward the end of it, I'm really glad to, to see so many people turn out. And the speakers have just been magnificent people speaking from their hearts. Now to get back to this world thing, I started getting phone calls from a lady in Australia who, as near as I can figure out, is sort of the Phyllis Schlafly of Australia. I looked her up on the internet, and this woman's got more degrees than the thermostat. She's written four books, and she's got the fifth book coming out. She asked that they withhold publication for two weeks, and they rewrote the first chapter to talk about our anti-agenda 21 bill in Alabama and how Alabama is fighting back against the United Nations. Now, two days ago, I got round trip tickets to Sydney, Australia from Birmingham. They are paying our way to Australia and carrying us around the country. We we're speaking at Parliament House and talking to different groups for 12 days. And I'm gonna get a copy of these speakers at this hearing and take it with us because what they wanna know is how you organize and how you get people together at the local level to defend themselves, and I have never seen a finer example of that than I've seen right here today. Amen. So I applaud you people. Now my son, I'm almost done here, fellas. I know you're tired, but uh, my son got back from Iraq not too long ago. He served a tour uh, with the Marines, and I was kind of cleaning up the aftermath when he came back home with all of his stuff, and I noticed he had a big poster on the, on the wall. He, he got a, a good sense of humor, and he, he likes this one site called despair.com, and they do funny posters. And this one was a picture of the, the Titanic sinking, only the stern sticking out of the water, and underneath it, it says, it may be that your only purpose in life is to serve as a warning to others. Well. Up until a year or so ago, I thought that the only purpose of Baldwin County, as far as Agenda 21 was concerned, would be to serve as a warning for others. What not to do, because believe me, down the road, you people, everybody in this county is going to drastically hate, you know, despise what happens to you when you lose your property rights. But nowadays, I think we can float that sucker. Amen. <laughs> I think, <laughs> what your county commission is doing here and bringing the issue back up for public comment and for hopefully uh, for killing the plan is, is admirable, greatly admirable, and you people turning out to speak against it is just wonderful. And I appreciate you uh, letting us come down and throw our two cents in, and uh, hopefully I can save my ranch in North Alabama. The reason I got in this is I got a hold of the Southeastern Ecological framework, framework drawn up by the EPA, and they color code all the property that is going to be taken as human-free habitat. And my ranch and all of my neighbor's ranch, everything within three miles of the Tennessee River is color-coded dark green. And that means animals only, people. So I know that if we don't win this fight, 
my children and hopefully my grandchildren, I don't have any yet, are going to lose their property and lose their future. And so that's why we're out scrapping, trying to stop this thing, and I greatly admire what you folks are doing in Baldwin County. Thank you very much. Mr. Brewer, next speaker. Don Casey. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Don Casey, uh, and I have to say that I've been reading about, writing about, and, and making presentations about sustainable development and smart growth and new urbanism since 1992. And in all of those years, I have never been in a room surrounded by so many patriots that absolutely know what happens when you adopt sustainable development. And we have a long history of sustainable development in this country. NEPA goes all the way back to the late uh, 1960s and early 70s. It has the tenets of sustainable development. It has, it only got its name until 1987 when the Grow Harlem Brookland Commission came in and labeled this philosophy that we now can see in this regional plan. Uh, let me just uh, briefly touch on some of the things I've given to you already. Uh, Democrats against Agenda 21. This is not a, a partisan issue. So we have Democrats on the other side of the aisle that also realize that this is uh, something that's going to strip us not only of our property rights, but so many other rights that we just take for granted. On the re reverse side is the uh, Republican National Committee uh, platform that Ken just referenced. Uh, in Tennessee, uh, and, and by the way, let me, let me say that here we have in Alabama, and what other time could, would you want to live uh, when, when you have a republic of the Alabama that has now become the only government in the world to recognize that sustainable development is an insidious process being implemented? <laughs> So, so, but what, what's going on in our neighboring states? And, and here I have a proclamation from Lewis County, Tennessee, and the county seat, Hollenwald, signed, signed by the elected officials. Just let me read one platform of this proclamation. Where, whereas the emphasis of local sustainability in every sector of society can only occur as individuals commit themselves to exemplifying those practices in their personal lives and inspire others to do the same. This is, in fact, a religion, if you look at the core of it. And here is a signed proclamation from elected officials. I have no idea why they signed this, but I will be day after tomorrow in the next county over, and I believe I'm going to meet some people that know some of the signatures on this. Now, on the reverse side of that is a, a law that was signed uh, by, into uh, or enacted in Tennessee back in 2009. And, and at the top of it is uh, HB 1468, and that was a House bill. The companion bill was Senate Bill 1919. And just going down to the uh, paragraph F, it says it, the state of Tennessee now is going to reconstruct its entire infrastructure on uh, uh, urban sustainability and eco-efficiency and global sustainable development principles. The entire state of Tennessee is going to spend money to incorporate this agenda. In Georgia, Georgia now has enacted HB 225, and it's called the Georgia Sustainable Agricultural Law. Now, we've been concentrating today on property rights. Property rights include your right to put a carrot, a steak, or, or potato on your plate and eat it when you want to. HB 225, get it and read it. It's not long. That's the entire law right there. Everything grown in Georgia is to be grown according to sustainable development principles. On the reverse side of this, you gentlemen have a copy of it, is a food charter because this will see that we have food councils who write food charters, and this food charter <laughs> says that government is going to determine how much food is necessary for the population. Doesn't that make you feel good? I think Jefferson said something if, about bread and government. If, if uh, government determines how much bread we'll need, guess what? We're going to go hungry. Well, here now is Georgia doing the same thing. Georgia has already fined an individual for growing too many tomatoes. You have the concept of food shed. Food shed is part of sustainable development, would be part of this plan, and it says that if food comes from outside your food shed, you have to pay a mitigation fee. We heard something about that a few minutes ago with the VMTs, vehicle miles traveled. 
So if you travel outside of a certain area or through an ecological sensitive area, you would be fined, I call it a sin tax against Mother Earth, for having violated the principles of sustainable development. Now I'm getting down close to the end, and we've had lots of people, several people, not lots, but several, stand up and talk about, well, this is just a, a plan, a guide, if you will. In 2005, October the 4th, uh, a Ms. Burnett, Diane Burnett, who was at the time, I don't know, you might, some of you may know her, uh, she was director of the planning for South Alabama Regional Planning Commission, and she stated and, uh, at this particular uh, event, the comprehensive plan is a legal document that will hold up in court Conversely, a deviation from the plan would not hold up in court. So you're going to have regulations written based off of this policy, and it will cover food sheds, fiber shed, because by the way, not only uh, are you expected to grow and consume the food within a specific area, but look up fiber shed, because your clothing now should come from within a 100 mile radius, and all the labor associated with making your, your clothing uh, within that fiber shed. Now, the, uh, just kind of closing up here, uh, section, Alabama Code section 1185-4, and we've heard many things talking about the comprehensive plan, whether or not it's mandatory. And it says that a regional plan c commission may, at its option, adopt a plan. So there's no requirement whatsoever. In some states, it is a requirement, but in Alabama, as far as I know, there's no requirement to have a plan at all. And after all, if the government plans your, your future and what you want to do on your property, uh, how much freedom is that? And, and who's doing the plan? What happened to private property rights? You know, I hear people all the time say, well, if we, we need a plan. I have a plan for my property and my family, and I want to institute that plan. And I want the government to, to back off and leave me alone and allow me that private property right. So I thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. At 109, I now close this public hearing. Commissioner Gruber. Uh, I've listened to a lot of y'all today, and uh, I've listened to a lot of other folks too. And the way I'm looking at this thing is that um, we've had a comprehensive plan since the early 80s. We, when we implemented zoning, that's part of the criteria of having uh, zoning, that you have to have a comprehensive plan. If you don't have a comprehensive plan, you cannot have zoning. So what, whatever we do here today, if we abolish our comprehensive plan and do not adopt another one right away, we have abolished zoning in Baldwin County because you have to have a comprehensive plan in, in force. Thank you. Uh, Council, uh, Commissioner Gruber made a statement that this would affect the current zoning. Is that correct? With, with uh, all due respect to Commissioner Gruber, I, I don't think that not having a comprehensive plan would, would completely undermine the zoning districts that have voted to come under zoning. And in, in well, fact, the way the comprehensive plan reads the comprehensive plan do only applies in the zoning districts. That's right. It does not apply in the unincorporated areas until they voted to come into under zoning. Thank you for that point of clarification. Thank you, Council. Commissioner Dorsey. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you all for taking the time to be involved in your local government today. If y'all will give me a few minutes, I'll try to be brief. Um, I have. I got, I got the tickle in my brain about running for office because Horizon 2025 was passed. It was alarming to me. I read pieces of it that were scary to me. And uh, time went by and, I, and finally I had something back in my head and I finally had, had to do something about it. And as was said earlier, it had a lot to do with my little boy who's five years old. I want him to see the liberty that, I've, that we've enjoyed, that we know about. I do feel like this plan, or I, I felt like this plan was an infringement on our private property rights. When I decided to run for office, I, just, I, I knew that this was going to be one of my campaign platforms. It's something I better know about. So I read the plan, which for those of you that have read it, I applaud you. Um, I share your pain. It is a sleeper, no doubt, and it's hard to read. But those of you that have read it through it, it's, it's, I appreciate you taking the effort to understand what's going on. A lot of people, I think, say they've read it and haven't read it and are talking about it. 
but I campaigned on basically, let's throw this in the trash, let's start over. And as we got to this topic here recently, um, friends of mine like uh, Mr. Chester McConnell, who I appreciate your viewpoint very much, I appreciate uh, your perspective, and I appreciate your involvement in our government. Don't, th don't throw it out, let's look at it, see if it can be amended. Billy Joe Underwood, who I respect very much, said, don't throw it out, let's amend it. So I wrote it again. I made a lot of notes in it. Can we amend it? Can we amend it? People are coming to us, people are talking, we're getting emails since this has been in the paper and been an agenda item for several weeks. A lot of people have had input, pro and, pro and con, this, that, and the other. And the only reason that I'm hearing to keep it is because a lot of people worked hard on it and we spent a lot of money. Don't waste that money. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not wasting the money if I vote to rescind this thing. That money was wasted by the last commission. They burnt that money. Now, when I, when I ran for office, I ran to be your county commissioner, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. I did not run for king. I'm willing to learn about things I don't know. I'm willing to talk about the issues. I'm willing to debate what's good in this plan and what's, what's bad in this plan, and can we amend it, can we not? What's the procedurally? Talking with Dan and David yesterday, procedurally is the right way to amend it, is the right way to throw it out, do we start over? Asking the questions that Commissioner Gruber's asking. If we don't have a plan, where are we? Where are we? Um, and quite frankly, um, besides the cost and the, I'm going to talk about it as a guide and I'm going to go through some things because quite frankly, besides Mr. Ernest today, who I appreciate your time and being here, is the only comment was about the trails and the walking paths is the only reason, is the only concrete reason of an item in this document to keep it. The only thing I've heard about is the walking trails. Besides, it costs a lot of money and, it, and we had a lot of input. I'll tell you about the input because I've if I'm going to come up here and do, do my job for y'all, I'm going to do my homework. We had five meetings. September 24, 2007 was, a, uh, <coughs> uh, a, was an advertised public meeting. It was 17 people attended. It was the sheriff, two of our highway employees, three commissioners, and 11 planning commission members came to that meeting to start talking about Horizon 2025. The, all of these meetings were hosted and uh, steered by the Genesis Group, which is the group that's written this thing. There are no minutes taken from any of these meetings. On 9:25, the next day was a public meeting that was advertised, advertised properly. 27 people attended. Of those, 20 were real people. And by, what I mean by that is they weren't government people. We had 20 people from the public show up to that meeting. On 9 26, 2007, we had what was called a joint group meeting. That meeting was not advertised. 36 people showed up. One, I'm calling a real person, but I'm not really sure it was a real person. Um, and I mean that because I don't know the email address is kind of, it looks more, looks funny. Um, and this is, the, this is the role that I'm getting from the county. So it's not like I'm making this up. I mean, there's a role that people signed in just like you signed in to speak here. Seven people were from federal, state, government, conservation groups. 16 people were either from cities or towns. Three people were from SARPSI. Uh, we had one from ALDOT, one from Mobile National Estuary uh, Program. We had one from Dauphin Island Sea Lab one representative from the Baldwin County School Board, and five Economic Development Chamber of Commerce types were at that meeting. The mega site was specifically mentioned at that meeting, um, and I don't know that because the minutes, we don't have any minutes because I've, <coughs> talked, to them, I've talked to some of the people who are at these meetings to find out what was going on at these meetings. The me mega site was mentioned. Please don't forget we're trying to draw industry to, uh, well, we've changed it. D we're trying to draw industry to the north end of the county. The Genesis group said, we'll consider it, we'll put it in consideration, thanks for your comment, appreciate it. Mentioned it again to our zoning director, and it was never put in that thing. You got a wildlife corridor that goes right through the mega site. I need people building jobs up there. I don't need, I'm not worried about the deer up there. We got tons of deer in North Baldwin County. Amen. On 926, we had another public meeting. This was the afternoon 926. It was properly advertised. 14 <coughs> people showed up, and, I would, and nine of those were not government types. On 927, there was a joint board meeting um, which was properly advertised, and there were 17 people, and it was all government types. So I've got nine, 10, I got 30 real people were in this process to talk about this plan when the public here, when the public comments were had. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you want to have in your comprehensive plan. So to tell me that a lot of people, we had a lot of public in involvement, is is to me a fallacy. A lot of people have talked today about Agenda 21. And I appreciate your perspective. I appreciate your insight. I'm aware of it. I'm concerned about my 
private property rights. I'm concerned about these initiatives that are out there in the world, whether it's conspiracy theory or tinfoil hats or any of that. I'm going to throw that all completely aside right now. I don't care. Uh, for, for the purpose of this discussion today, for, for my, the rest of my talk, I don't care about that. Uh, Mr. Oaken, I appreciate your service on the Planning Commission. Thank you. Um, I know it's a thankless job, and I appreciate the time and effort and the dedication that you personally, I know you do your homework when you come there, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that for the people of Baldwin County. Um, your comments were with regard, and, and not trying to argue with everybody here, but the comments were that we'll amend it to get it in, in place with the act. I, I, personally, I, I didn't run for this because of the act that wasn't passed. I ran for this because this is a bad plan for Baldwin County. I want this changed because it's a bad plan for Baldwin County. If we, can, if we could amend it to make it better for Baldwin County, I said I was open to that. I've done my homework on that. I don't agree with that at this point. If I may have a couple of minutes to talk about things that are in the plan that if you don't know about, you need to know about, and the public probably doesn't know about. To talk about this as a guide, to me is a, fa a fallacy because the word policy is used 778 times in that document. When there are conflicting policies, the more stringent statement from the county's perspective shall have prefer preference over the less stringent. <clears throat> I'm going to go on before I make some comments on some of this stuff. Um, and I appreciate everyone's time and listening to me uh, talk about this, but it's important to everybody, and it's a big uh, item that everybody's concerned about. The word shall is used 525 times in this document. The word must is used 51 times. Um, and there is some uh, verbiage in here that basically says that shall doesn't really mean shall. Let me explain, let me read that to you because it's, it's concerning. Accordingly, the language used in this plan is expressly intended to be precatory and not mandatory. I've heard that from a lot of folks and I appreciate that. The use of such words as shall or should or may or can and other such language wherever it appears in this plan is intended as a guideline, not a stricture unless otherwise specified in Baldwin County Zoning Ordinance, Subdivision Regulations, or the Flood Damage Prevention Ordinance, which is where your property is really regulated, as uh, Mr. Oaken referred to. Um, but to me, and the way I was raised, uh, with, under the guidance of, under the, basically, um, absolute, the, the term absolute truth, that words mean things, in our definitions on this document, do you know, does everyone agrees that we live in a community? Well, a community in this document is defined as a sustainable human habitat, which is complete and compact. Its smallest theoretical manifestation is the neighborhood. In ecology, an assemblage of populations of different species within a specified location and time. That is no community that I care to live in. So I don't care for that to be a part of, I don't. <laughs> In the definitions, we have the uh, crime prevention through environmental design uh, portion of this thing, a design method with the goal of preventing crime through designing a physical environment that positively influences human behavior based on the following four strategies, natural surveillance, territorial reinforcement, natural access control, and target hardening. Again, not a place I want to live. I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> Existing structure, a structure that was constructed prior to October 9th, 1985, and for which all required state and local and federal authorizations were obtained prior to October 9, 1985. Secondary definition, when referring to an existing structure having nonconformity or being grandfathered, this refers to structures that are in existence prior to the zoning ordinance being implemented in a particular planning district. So we've just wiped out 20 years. Um, the term, uh, I think Mr. Casey and several folks have mentioned, uh, smart growth is in this document. Um, and oh, uh, here, uh, let's see here. Uh, policy, the way in which programs and activities are conducted. Uh, to achieve an identified goal. So the policy word has been used in here 700 times. Uh, objective, the same kind of thing. I'm trying to speed this up a little bit. Um, smart growth, planning regulatory and developmental practices and techniques that pr promote compact mixed use development that offers a high quality living and working environment and encourages a choice of travel modes, e.g. walking, cycling, and transit while protecting environmental features and resources. I don't see one thing about the uh, about uh, cars. Um, 
And if those of you that know me, I, I like combustion engines. Um, I'm going to try to be quick on this because uh, there are a few items in here that are just that are absolutely alarming. That are why the the well, I appreciate the comment about it being a recipe. Um, some of the some of the uh, ingredients in here are not palatable to me. The county's current land use cover map was the base. Uh, data used to create the future land use categories following the Smart Growth America and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Smart Growth Guidelines. Smart Growth America is a coalition of national, state, and local organizations working to improve the ways we plan and build towns, cities, metro areas that we all call home. And I defined smart growth for you earlier. Um, to speed this up, there are um, things in the uh, map that are attached that uh, are concerning because it ref the plan refers to our major roadway plans, evacuation, safety, hurricane things, um, and the Baldwin Beach Express, the section that we drive on now, along with the section that we're working on to I-10, as well as the plan to I-65, are not on that map, are not considered in that plan. Um, so we're not, so the plan is already out of whack, it was out of whack when they built it. Uh, to promote opportunities for well-planned industrial development does not have any of the uh, mega site uh, information on there or any of the industrial sites. Well, you say, well, that was 2007, that was through 2009. This county, the previous county commission was working on the Baldwin Beach Express and the mega site at that time. So it's not that it was changed after the adoption of this. There are terms, uh, uh, Mr. Smart, if you'd be willing to help us understand if, if you're gonna start agriculture tourism at your place, the uh, document encourages that. It talks a lot about uh, affordable housing, um, but my experience is that we're not, the, the Planning Commission has not been real, uh, real good in trying to stimulate um, uh, affordable housing. And when you read into the requirements this has for housing developments, human scales, and some other things that are really alarming, that it's impossible to build affordable housing in Baldwin County. And I'm not talking because I'm guessing. I've been in that business since I was 18 years old. I know how to build affordable housing in this county. I've been doing it since 1996. I'm experiencing this. The more regulations and the more of this stuff that you put in there and the more you drive up the cost, we're running our people out. We're running out folks like y'all that ain't rich. We're running out the folks that are working today because they can't be here to say, hey, don't do that to me. I mean, that's what the county is. Even the rest of the state thinks we're all a bunch of rich folks down here. That's not, this does not allow for us to build affordable housing, no matter how you define it. And we're going to work, and then it says we shall cooperate with the Baldwin County Housing Alliance. Well, I've been, I've got experience with that group. Let me tell you what, we don't need their help for nothing. Because what they want is, all they want to do is figure out how to get grant money so they can keep paying themselves. It's, for, it's awful. It's an awful organization. It says that we want to encourage workers to live, the, work, the poor folks, we'll put them over there, they got to, we want to encourage them to live within a mile and a half of where they work. What kind of freedom is that? We got, we got a, a, some policies in here about farm worker housing. There are things in here that refer to, I'm not going to skip reading all this stuff because it's getting long, but the, putting the, where the county is basically in the development business, where we're growing uh, the county um, to get into chemical and biological assessment monitoring. All, all of this is in here. I've got this, every bit of this highlighted. We're going to invest in longleaf pine forestry areas. Commissioners, we've looked at the budget. We don't have the opportunity to do that today. Baldwin County shall identify upland areas needed to establish significant greenway and wildlife corridors, minimum foot, minimum width 400 feet. Every 112 feet is an acre. Every running 112 feet is an acre. I don't know how many linear on there. We're going to reduce greenhouse gas. One of the things in there says reduce the impacts to electrical supply, the local electrical supply. Please define how we're going to do that. Are we going to tell you all to turn your dryers off? I have no idea. We have um, something that's funny in here that uh, Mr. Cutright uh, mentioned or touched on was uh, regarding the wildlife corridors. Um, to f what objective 481, to, f to foster more education and protection rules on the wildlife to man interface relationship within Baldwin County. Unplug me from the matrix, please. Um, <laughs> We're, it, says, it suggests that we implement state, federal uh, mandated programs to maintain uh, and protect uh, air quality. The EPA tried to pass an ozone changes last year that would have, which would have kept Airbus from coming here. It would keep us from generating, a, doing significant manufacturing up at the mega site. We don't want to be a part of that. We need to figure out ways that businesses can create jobs for our people.
I'm, I'm skipping over some of the crazy stuff in here, but one of the things that's mentioned uh, has been mentioned a couple of times in some of the emails that at least I've received and I assume my colleagues have talk, are concerned about water quality and stormwater and that this plan saves our waters. This plan, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't do a thing for our water quality. We, this commission, all, the four gentlemen up here, we are dedicated to fixing stormwater quality. We're tackling our subdivision regulations here in the next, next this week and, and, and as we move through the process. And one of the biggest things we're trying to figure out is how to manage our stormwater for new development, how we're gonna manage that going forward. That's where you save stormwater. That's where you save our water quality. That's our job. And if you don't like the way we're doing it, that's when you kick us out. That's our responsibility to hand it down to the planning commission for them to do their job. Our num well, our number two, one of our top priorities for uh, our Restore Act wish list is to develop, uh, Mr. Market has worked hard with our, uh, some engineers that are helping us define and study and model our watersheds as they are today. Not just the Fish River, not just the water, uh, Weeks Bay watershed, not just the Dolly watershed. We're going to tackle all of them, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to figure out how to implement the plan that'll save, that'll make it so that we are, we are going backwards in time with stormwater discharge and stormwater quality, stormwater quality by having regional detention. That's our number one, number two project behind the finishing the Baldwin Beach Express up to the north, up to 65. That's a priority for this group. So stormwater quality, us saying that we don't want to do this anymore doesn't say we don't care about the environment, doesn't say we don't care about water quality. Um, I'll skip over some of the ridiculousness about marinas. Um, uh, there are things in here that provide access, to, that uh, developments that provide access to beaches, shores, waterways may be eligible for incentives, but incentives aren't defined. There's also talk of a point system, and it just, that'll be, that'll be that, that facilitates a buddy deal. I mean, I'm going to give you more because it's, it's, it's not black and white. It's not yes or no, it's, which is what the law should be. The Section 6 on parks is uh, good for the most part, except for uh, it asks for requirement or dependence on the Secretary of Interior. Um, I think that this commission is working hard to, to improve our parks, to invest in parks, and to have a better park system through the county. It's what the people demand. It's how we, it's how we enjoy our community. Um, section 8 is uh, historic resources. John Jackson and this commission do a good job to, to, to mitigate, to save our historic resources and take care of the, the culture and the history that is so rich in this county. Uh, chapter 7 is blank. Chapter 9 talks about what you can and can't build. I'll skip reading that stuff, but it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, it does talk about the quality of architecture, so somebody somewhere is going to decide that your architecture is quality enough for us in Baldwin County or, or um, we're going to talk about uh, that if you're a lot small enough that you can't have fences in your backyard. Um, it talks about window placement on your, on your structure. It talks about hin uh, human scale. It talks about placement on a drive through So if you're going to McDonald's, we're going to, this, plan, this comprehensive plan makes suggestions as a guide, as a plan on where McDonald's is going to put their drive through uh, I'll skip that. There's a discussion in here on page 120 about a community plan, which is another layer of regulation that would be incorporated into this, into this plan. Uh, chapter 10, I've railed on that about government coordination um, before. Uh, that's, that's, the bottom line is here, this plan can't be amended. It's so bad, and it's so off of where the principles and the character of Baldwin County are, that we just need to, we need a plan, and I don't, need, I don't need to pay some guy from Jacksonville to come tell me how our quality of life got to be where we are and where we're going to go forward. Um, man, I could be here for, I could be here for a long time, and I all already have, and I'm sorry about that. Um, our, <laughs> our, uh, our community got to this place because of the, people and the character. It's why we love it. It's why I love being here. It's because of what the, the, the character and the responsibility of the people in here. You can't, you cannot legislate good behavior. I mean, you can, but you can't. When it comes down to it, it's about being good people, and Baldwin County is full of good people. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to cut short. I, got, I could keep going, but I'm going to stop because it's been a long way. Um, and again, I appreciate everybody being here. I appreciate your comments. appreciate you being involved in the, in the process. Thank you all. Sure you don't have anything else to say. I got lots more, but I'll quit. Mr. Burt.
Not yet. We're, we, we have due process, Mr. Levitt. I, I'll make mine brief. First of all, I just it's a demonstration of what a republic is. It's where you elected officials that represent you, the people. And when we don't represent you, the people, uh, you change your representation. That happened to this commission two years ago. Uh, so the people at that time, I guess, saw to make a change. They weren't happy with their representation. I wasn't happy with that, this Horizon 2025 plan from the time it started. Five years ago, anybody that could read writing, as Red Wilkins once told me about not being a lawyer, he said, well, Frank, you can read writing, can't you? So, I, and I discovered I could. And so I started reading this, and, and everything about it was just as anti-American as anything I ever knew. And, and so I opposed against it, worked against it, and voted against it when it came to the, before the commission, but it passed on a 3-1 vote. I've been opposed to it ever since then. Prior to that time, we had a plan. We had a map. And that map you see right there on this plan was approved on July the 7th. This Horizon 2025 plan was approved July 7th, 2009. On 2006, July 2000, uh, 2009, July 6th of 2009, that was a plan that was in place. They had that plan. 18 planning commissions, the people of that, those, in those planning commissions had signed a petition, or came, uh, petitioned the commission for a referendum, and they had voted for zoning. Along about that time was when the Horizon 2025 consultants came on board and all this other stuff started circulating. Not one planning district has voted for zoning in their district since the conversation about Horizon 2025 began. People aren't stupid. Anybody that can read writing can read writing and understand knows that is a bad plan. If I vote for zoning, that may not be the law. They may tell you it's just the plan, but you can bet your bottom that it's not just a plan because I saw them use it before when, when somebody came for a rezoning of their property, piece of agricultural property down off of 98, I believe it was. The lady came before us, it was a good plan. She had owned the property for some time. It had been farmed 15 years before that. But when she went before the planning commission, they said, well, our strategic plan says that's farmland, so you can't use it for what she wanted to use it for. She was turned down. It came before the commission. There wasn't but three members of us here. I voted no, and two of them voted yes to support the planning commission. One of them sitting out there now, and the others have been here. They turned her down because, according to that 2025 plan, it's farmland. You can't use it for what you wanted. Best use, as somebody said earlier. Reasonable and best use. But it, it's a bad plan. It's been a bad plan from its start. And I hope and pray today we'll throw this thing out. And I guess we'll call it for that. Anything else? That's it, Mr. Chairman. Good job, Eric. You both kept it pretty short. I'm impressed. But, so I, I have a little time to speak. You know, and one of the things I want to say, you know, uh, Mr. Thompson, you gave me this Communist Manifesto. It was a pretty neat idea back in the mid 18th century. Until Stalin and, and Mao Zedong got a hold of it and killed millions of people. Same with fascism. You know, when Mussolini and uh, Hitler got a hold of it, millions of people died. 
They were just plans, guides, outlines. But words have meanings. Uh, Commissioner Dorsey mentioned that. And they have definitions. And words like policies and objectives and goals. We look at those and you know, we glance through it. And I promise you, the first time I, I read through the Horizon 2025 book, you know, just kind of glancing through it, and it's like not a bad plan. But when you go in there and you start looking at the mechanics and how does, do you implement this, the first thing that came to mind is that we are going to take people's private property rights. I am smarter than the people that own that land, and I can tell them what to do. Folks, that's not America. You know, our, 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 our Fifth Amendment, you know, two things that it does is due process and just compensation. Today we saw part of due process as we've gone through this. Everybody was given an opportunity to speak pro, con, show their passions, their concerns on, on Horizon 2025 and, and maybe some auxiliary items. That's America. A couple weeks ago, I was crushed as, as chairman of the Baldwin County Commission. I'm probably one of the most important elected officials in Baldwin County, or at least according to our county administrator, Mr. Brewer. And along with Commissioner Gruber and Commissioner Burt, we attended a planning commission meeting. We came, as many citizens came, to discuss a letter that we had heard about, a meeting that was going to be happening where the county's representative, uh, Mr. Jackson, was not invited or kept in the loop, where our county attorney who gives counsel to the planning commission was not invited, and the court stenographer who records all that data. The meeting was moved from its normal location at the Robertsdale Annex to another facility outside of Robertsdale down in Somerdale. But we were told that no public comment would be taken or allowed during this meeting. You know, and I know a lot of those planning commission meeting members, but if people come, you have to give them an opportunity to speak. And I don't care if they're wearing bib overalls or 1970 leisure suits. They have a right to address the people that affect their property. And I want you to think about that. If I told you today, I didn't want to hear your comments. You would not appreciate that. Well, if the Planning Commission treats the commissioners with such disrespect, what are they doing to the average Joe? Folks, that should be a tremendous concern is when we lose our opportunity to address our elected and appointed officials. It's very dangerous. It did happen in the Soviet Union. It did happen in Germany. And if we're not careful, it's going to happen here in America. And guess what? Right here in Baldwin County. So I'm glad that you're all standing up and coming today. This battle is more than just planning. This is to protect the Constitution of the United States and what's in it, and to me, even the Ten Commandments that God gave us. You know, the Tenth Commandment is, I shall not covet. You know, it's interesting, the Ten Commandments is such a negative document about what we shouldn't do. Our Bill of Rights in our Constitution, to the most part, is a negative document. What government can't do to us, what they can take away from us. Now, I appreciate our counsel here, but there are some people that have gotten a hold of this and twisted it. I've been, I've been accused of being a caveman. I like being a caveman. Things ought to be simple, <laughs> and everybody should be able to understand them. Like Commissioner Burke says, you ought to be able to read it and figure it out. And I have somebody tell you, no, that's not what it means. I can't support this plan. It needs to go. 
I, I, and Mr. Oak and I, I appreciate your service and Mr. Williams' service, but I hope that you will really look at the way you conduct your meetings to allow the public to have conduct, uh, participation in that process. This commission has addressed a lot of, of agencies that have dealt done business with us. I think we've been a little remiss on our relationship with the Planning Commission of change. We hold the people that we do business with accountable now with contracts to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. We're looking very hard at our agreements with people like SARPSI, a non-governmental organization that we're trying to figure what's the added value that the federal government sends some NGO money and they, then they decide whether to send it into the county services or not. Makes no sense to me, folks. This country is $1.3 trillion in debt. We can't sustain that. We've got to make changes. And so we're right there, I think, on the precipice of where we're going to be heading as a nation. We can end up going to a totalitarian state very quickly if this thing collapses. Or, like y'all did today, stand up and let's take America back. Amen. And with that, commissioners, I would entertain a motion. Bill to send void and nullify the Horizon 2025, the Baldwin County Comprehensive Plan 2008-2025. Commissioners? Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt this resolution and rescind uh, the Horizon 2025 plan. Motion by Commissioner Burt. Second. Second by Commissioner Dorsey. Any discussion, Commissioner Dorsey? Clarification, you basically uh, making the motion as stated in the agenda item before yes. us, remanding it back to the as, uh, body. As, Thank you. As stated by administrator. Commissioner Gruber? Yes, that's what I just want to make. We're remanding this to them to start their review. Or are we just, or is the plan completely gone and we're starting from scratch? That's, that's my only question. If that's not clear, I want to withdraw my motion. <laughs> I'll withdraw my second. No, uh, please don't, because I was going to get clarification from the council. Codified as resolution number 2009-94 is hereby repealed, rescinded, voided, and nullified. It says, further be it resolved, that resolution number 2009-94, adopted at the July 7, 2009 regular meeting, is hereby expressly and immediately repealed, rescinded, voided, nullified, and no longer of any force or effect. So the clear implication of this resolution is that the Horizon 2025 20, plan will be repealed, rescinded, and voided in its entirety. That's the motion that I want to make as read by council, Mr. Chairman. Well, only, only one comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. A, a lot of this began and people began to wake up and become aware, especially the people who lived on the Magnolia River or had property right on the river and Fish River when all of a sudden it seems the Corps of Engineers was in the process of, of rewriting regulations or considering existing regulations. They had regulations in place, I believe, where you could only build uh, 100 square feet of pier and boathouse and all combined. Well, for some reason, for about five or six years, they, haven't, they hadn't enforced that regulation. But then they were in the preparation of adopting new regulations, and they came up with some arbitrary number, as somebody said earlier, of 920 square feet. That's all you could have. Your pier couldn't be over five foot wide, had to be five foot above the water, all sorts of stuff, and that's going on right now today. Well, I guess it ends at 12. And so many people down there had that same fear and so they began to rise up. They called the commissioners, they called whomever, and that helped wake this up. And those who said that plan really wasn't anything but a plan, they found out quick, quickly, because my understanding, and council can decide if I'm right or not, that that, that plan and the reason the Corps was redrawing or rewriting the regulations 
was because of Weeks Bay National Estuary had to sign off on sign off on those regulations because it was in the riverine area that uh, that Weeks Bay gets the water from or flows there. So they had some control through some of these backdoor policies, as he said earlier, that uh, that that was uh, not a, that was not uh, ratified by the Senate. But immediately, when that was turned down, all the bureaucrats and everybody else started running to try to find, get under a door somewhere, or through a back door, or climb in a window. And then pretty soon, they're regulating the Mobile NEP, through Mobile NEP, through the Weeks Bay National Estuary Program, with all of these things, with their grants and that. That's what helped wake it up down here in Baldwin County. And uh, I thank God for them. It was a grave mistake when they did that, but I'm certainly glad that people are waking up and they're not just waking up in Alabama. I'm glad to see Baldwin County is one of the first ones to wake up down here yeah. and say to throw these plans out. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Burt. Again, uh, you know, this is just a start. You need to stay involved. Yeah. It's important, and it's so nice to come here today and see so many people that have that passion. But use that passion for more than just this one issue. Again, I have no more comments. Uh, with that saying, all in favor of this motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries three to one. With the light from above, from the mountain.